a chat um, and then we can jump right in. Uh, so for those of you who may not know me, my name is Marquis Jenkins. I'm a community organizer and I am proud uh, to stand and lead the residents to preserve public housing. And so, when I say public housing is under attack, you all respond by saying, Fight back! That's right, when public housing is under attack, what do we do? Fight back! Oh, come on, I need to go. Stand up, fight back! Hi, y'all ready? Yeah. Yeah. When public housing is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! What do we do? Stand up, fight back! What do we do? Stand up, fight back! So it is cold today, and that is not stopping any one of us from coming out and lifting our voices. Today we stand before you ahead of the City Council Committee on Public Housing hearing to talk about resident engagement. The Housing Authority has done less than a poor job on engaging residents at every decision making that impacts the lives of public housing residents to the point of making decisions that are literally having a direct impact on public housing residents' house. When we talk about resident engagement, again, we are talking about every single decision that the Housing Authority makes that impacts the residents. But today, you are going to hear some speakers focus on four areas. The first, we're going to be focusing on elections. We have the right to form a resident council, a district council, and a citywide resident council. And the way elections are conducted are skewed and, and conducted in a way that favors the New York City Housing Authority and that does not allow the rank and file residents to have a say in decision making at public housing. The last city, the citywide council of presidents election, the ballot was won. The election was won by one ballot, and you will hear from residents on how that election was happening. With. Second thing we'll be talking about is rad pack. PAC, Permanent Affordable Commitment Together. And as our leaders will say, there is no together in the PAC program or the rental assistance demonstration program. Residents do not have a say it's in, in terms of if their development goes to the RAD and PAC program. The third is the Public Housing Preservation Trust. The New York City Housing Authority just released is so-called draft voting regulations for residents to have an opportunity to, quote, opt-in to the Public Housing Preservation Trust. What is opt-in when they're only asking 10% of residents to weigh in on such a huge decision, meaning the majority of residents will have no clue or will not be expected to understand or even vote in a decision that will impact their lives? And last, the biggest form, the greatest form of resident engagement is to actually give residents the power to make decisions, to allow residents to form resident management corporations and have true say, decision making, and power over the future of their homes. Today, we will not allow the, the Public Housing Authority to silence us. We are grateful for our elected officials who stand with us today who are helping to elevate public housing resident voices. And to get us started, we are going to hear from the chair of the City Council's Committee on Public Housing. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Councilwoman Alexa Avila. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, our champion. What a shake up. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Yeah. It's cold, but we fired up. So here we are. So good afternoon. My name is Alexa Vilas, and I am the council 
proud member representing District 38, which is Sunset Park in Red Hook, and the proud chair of the Public Housing Committee. Uh, public housing residents have ideas and solutions about the challenges they live with on a daily basis. They also have goals and aspirations about the future of their homes. We should and must center the importance of empowering residents in all of our work. Today, we are going to hear testimony from NYCHA and most importantly from the residents themselves on NYCHA's resident engagement efforts. This is not a new topic, but a long-standing pain point for frustrated residents. If NYCHA truly aims to build trust after years of disinvestment and public scandal, the authority must set a higher standard for itself and do underscore bold exclamation point actually do the work necessary to empower the residents to make their voices heard i asked nitra to revise its outreach strategy relying on traditional stuff like robocalls and flyering that nobody reads in the hallways does not engage or empower residents in decision direct person-to-person -person conversations and group discussion that center those voices, call upon their expertise, is the way to move forward. Where they, there may have been some steps forward, we seem to be stuck. And despite piloted efforts of robust partnerships, NYCHA has partnered with community-based organizations in moments of sanity and has done some decent work. But it seems that none of those lessons about what real community engagement stick, and they go back to their regular antics. This hearing will be the first opportunity in many years that the council will have, will have had held on resident engagement, and it will be an important opportunity for NYCHA to state for the record its actual efforts, its commitments, its lessons, and to take a pulse on how residents experience their engagement. Lastly, I just want to remind everyone that as part of the Public Housing Preservation Trust, NYCHA was required to establish and receive public feedback on voting procedures for residents to determine the future of their homes. And in fact, the comment period is approaching very quickly. November 23rd is the end. It was a very aggressive six-week public comment period for something as profound as an important, profound and important as the determining the future of your development, six weeks is no time at all. I said that when they were considering the legislation. I said that the voting process to be determined was something with wide gaping holes that you could drive a truck through and gave me no real confidence that we would be able to set up a, a, a thorough and efficient process. Nevertheless, here we are. So I want to urge all the residents, November 23rd, include your voices. Say what you need to say. Make sure that you are on the record. And lastly, I want to thank all the TA presidents, all the NYCHA residents, and all the allies who have been working really hard on the serious time constraint to inform residents about the proposals and their implications on the table. There is an enormous amount of confusion. And that is only for me. That's part of the game. You keep people confused and uninformed. They are unable to make the decisions that are best for them. And so we need to do better. So I encourage the residents again to keep doing what you're doing. Keep us accountable. Keep us on the record. An organized and well-represented tenant voice is one of NYCHA's greatest assets. And yet its biggest fear that it can't seem to harness. If the authority seeks to preserve and improve public housing the way it says on every piece of literature that it likes to distribute, it must lean into not only engaging residents, but truly empowering them. Empowering them to make sure that they are centered in decision making. We don't want to be made aware. We don't want to be just offered recommendations. They need to be in decision making roles and authority. And so I look forward to hearing all of the feedback today at the hearing. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Here is to resident empowerment. And the one thing I just have to add is that
they offered three options on this voting for the trust. One that was never even considered in the legislation. They offered residents to make a choice of status quo. What does that mean? Brad Pact, never mentioned in the legislation. And Housing Preservation Trust. They failed to mention one of the most critical pieces, resident-managed corporations that yes. bring decision-making to yes. residents. Yes. Why did they not include that fourth option? It is a very telling omission. So with that, thank you so much. I look forward to the hearing today. Thank you for the work you're doing. When NYCHA says get back, we say fight back. back. When NYCHA says get back, we, we say, say fight back. back. So NYCHA completely confuses, or maybe they know exactly what they're doing, because we don't get resident engagement. We get a marketing campaign targeted towards residents to manufacture consent from residents. Residents are not asked to use their expertise, but they are told, this is what we are going to do. What color would you like your halls to be? These are the two experts, the residents. And I want you to hear from one of our most dynamic leading experts, our resident from Smith Houses, yes. And the Manhattan District Cop Chair, yes. Ms. Aisa Torres. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, resident engagement. Um, in my 12 years as TA president, one of my biggest things with NYCHA has been you're supposed to include us from conception. Right. That's not what happens. Um, and the 964, which is what regulates all of the resident councils, is most NYCHA managers actually don't know what the 964 is and what they are under the regulation supposed to be part of in terms of including us in the process, right? And, and in doing that, I can tell you that when you have true resident engagement, then things work out because then it's we're working together. So my campaign to be chairperson of NYCHA for the last two years has been that when NYCHA was run by residents for residents, truly, truly, there was resident input and there was respect. And for those of you who don't know, it you know when they say, oh, the residents don't know what they're doing or they don't know how. Guess what? We had a reserve in the billions. In the billions, not in the millions. And so what does that tell you? That we do know how to run a, a resident association? That we do know how to run NYCHA? And better than them, than having vendors that come in and look down on us? A lot of the residents in public housing are paying mortgage rents, and we are so disrespected, and we pay taxes. And so, I say this, I'm demanding, I'm demanding on behalf of all the residents in public housing and in my district and in my development that NYCHA give us true resident input, real resident, and respect us as human beings because we deserve it. We have a right to it. It is our right and we have fought for it. And I, and I beg to say, and I want to thank everybody for being here that we cannot continue this way. People are getting sick and people are dying because NYCHA will not listen. You see that sign? He needs to finally go. And we we have now a gut, we now have a NYCHA that the chairman doesn't even live in New York. Forget it, not even in New York State. He's in another state on the other side of the country. And it is unconscionable unconscionable that the mayor and everyone is allowing that to happen. For the kind of money that he's doing, I can get at least one door changed in my apartment, in, in my development. I am done. And I think that we have a right to say that this is not resident engagement. We're not talking about staff. We're not talking about the people who work in resident engagement. We are talking about the administration, the top people who are making a whole lot of money out of the rent we pay, because if people think we pay $5 rent, you're so mistaken. And we need 
to have a voice and we need to be respected and we're not we're not and that's all i can say and i thank you for your time our builders are in horrible conditions when you look at every single public housing development there's a scaffolding you can go to any development in the city and you will see scaffolding. True, true. You can true. go to any development and you will find an apartment with mold in it, with lead in it. Mm -hmm. But Aisa is absolutely right. We are not just fighting for the builders or to repair the builders. Those 964 regulations are unique to public housing. They give us rights that no other resident in this city has. The right to organize the right to have space to organize, the right for funding to support that organizing effort, the right to secession rights, yes. to pass these apartments down to our loved ones. Yes. There are so many rights that we stand to lose by converting from Section 9 to Section 8. I am so proud that we have our elected officials standing beside us because they understand, they listen to the residents. And one of those elected officials is standing tall with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Chris Monte. Yes. 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 Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Chair Alexa Vilas for holding this hearing to keep NYCHA accountable and to tell them, as we're all telling them, they do a poor job with resident engagement. I want to give you a story of last night. Last night, NYCHA decided to hold a meeting in one of my developments and invited all NYCHA developments on the Lower East Side. So from the Smith Houses to Baruch to the First Houses to Valadics, all these developments were going to go to this one meeting to learn about the trust. How many people showed up? Out of 100,000 residents, I can tell you only 80 residents showed up. And whose fault is that? NYCHA. 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 <laughs> when I went to one of my tenants from Sewer Park Extension and said, why are you the only person here? She told me, we didn't even have a, a flyer in our lobby. A flyer in my lobby telling me about this meeting. It was a random email that she happened to open up that was in her promotion box that led her to this meeting. That's not resident engagement. And in that two and a half hour meeting, they had a 30 minute section where they were gonna send the NYCHA representative to each table to talk to them, to answer their questions. I sat across the TA president of LaGuardia, right next to a resident in the Smiths. No one showed up for 25 minutes. So out of that 30 minute opportunity to talk to a NYCHA representative, about the issues that we are facing and the issues that we want to be talk to talk about around the trust, we only have five minutes. And when I talked to that representative from NYCHA, I said 10% is unacceptable when it comes to the voting procedure. And you know what he told me? That he heard a NYCHA resident say that they only wanted 5%. I have said, how much money did you give her to right. say that? Right. Because we all know this is BS. Right. We have known for decades that NYCHA does not, does not do any type of engagement. Every single day, my office gets emails, phone calls about mold, about people coming to inspect and never showing up. People just having to paint a little patch, but come and take a photo and never return. Uh, that ain't right. That, that ain't right. right. No, no, we see right. the no, lack no. of engagement on a day-to-day, -day, on a minute-minute -minute basis when it comes to some of our most vulnerable people. And so we're here to, today to say, NYCHA, you better step up. If not, we're gonna take NYCHA back and we're gonna make sure that the residents have the power and have the say on what happens to our development. Because what happens this year and next year is gonna really decide the lifespan of these complexes. And so we are here to make sure that they listen to us and we take back our homes. 
Thank you all. Thank you. Get City Council more oversight over NYCHA, 94-14. We have some dynamic elected officials who get it. And on the other hand, we have some elected officials who need to be educated. The truth of the matter is public housing works. Public housing provides a space for generations after generations. Some of our residents are third generations in their apartment, living in the same apartment for 30, 40, 50 years. In a city where we have skyrocketed homelessness, yes. it is unacceptable that you want to tarnish the one program that works. I need to remind all of those elected officials who voted for the trust that the funding that comes through Section 9 comes from the same people who want to promise funding under Section 8. Under the guise that Section 8 is a better program. It's a better program because that's where they decide to put the money. But if we put the money into public housing, we will see magnificent things happen, especially when residents take over and residents become the managers of their own development. We have so many, as I said before, so many resident experts that our elected officials need to listen to, and I'm going to bring another expert up to talk to you. All the way from Taft Houses, Ms. Beverly McFarland. Public housing residents got hit twice as hard. Yes. 
Why? Because not only was our chairman too busy focusing on not trying to push this plan, but it was the repair issues that they refused to pay for and refused to make that exacerbated the spread of COVID-19. The environmental impact on public housing all across the city is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. From arsenic to let arsenic in the in the in water, the water. Mm -hmm. arsenic in the soil, our people are dying. Yes. yes. This yes. is an emergency. Yes. yes. We right. cannot wait for the conversion of Section 8 to make the necessary repairs. We need our elected mm -hmm. officials to do what they gotta do to bring us the money that we need. Mm -hmm. Public housing works when it is properly funded. Yes, yes. To talk a little bit more about the environmental impacts that we have, we are bringing on the public housing's attorney, our true advocate, Mr. Joe Cuffman. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Joe. <laughs> Greetings. I just want to say that it's not just a question of money, it's a question of enforcement and the money being spent the right way. Correct. Right oh. now, FEMA has given a billion dollars for improvements on Hurricane Sandy damage. This money has been given to contractors who have done wrong, have opened up the soil and then put it back, have left the soil out there. We have high levels of arsenic and lead in that soil, all right? And the worst part is it could be easily fixed, easily fixed by doing ground cover and covering it up. But NYCHA refused to make these contractors do that simple work. What they did is they paid them $85 million at Smith, money at St. Nick's, and every one of those was bad, leaving trees coming down leaving that soil that's there and paying bad, bad contractors, all right? We're concerned right now, the latest in the news is Reese. We found the soil piles are this high. We tested the soil and we found 15.9 parts per million of arsenic. New York State Health Department says 1.1 parts per million is dangerous and 0.1 is dangerous for people with cancer. What did NYCHA do? Nothing. They didn't cover it up. They paid the contractor all that money and the bad people at Smith that we pointed us out, they promoted them. So I believe, as an environmental attorney, that there's environmental insults that are leading to lethal endangerment that's out there. But the worst part is the people that are in charge are actually just giving money to, 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 to pay them. And as much as we criticize NYCHA, I have to say that we trust the private landlords even worse. Yes, yes, yes. New York City is owed $1.4 billion in uncollected fines. So we are gonna hand this over to these buildings and give them $300 fines, and all of those landlords and contractors are insulting us by not even paying those fines. So I think it's really, really important, especially in the age of COVID, that we take back this control and we get, you know, that the health engagement is high up there. They don't even want to test. And one of the lines that I keep on repeating over and over again, that a slight increase in exposure to PM 2.5, that's the little dust particles that's out there and every time an asbestos worker comes in or the contractor comes in and creates dust, that's dust coming down. A slight increase in that, over a long period of time, and every night resident is facing that, increases COVID death. So we have a health problem that's, that's out of the charts, and it's NYCHA is, is letting these people go. I reached out to a lot of federal agencies, EPA, HUD, and others that want to come in and do help. They offer help, and NYCHA says no. The other part is, it's the workers that are getting hurt also. The staff workers that are there. We asked OSHA, to step in and have an advisory partnership program that they would give free advice to every one of the developments and not give a fine, and NYCHA said no. So 
It's not a question of money, it's the opposite. They just don't want to know, they don't want to test the soils, but they also don't want to test even the blood um, and, and the urine and the hair at Reese that would tell us how dangerous it is. And everyone, I would say, it's similar to Flint, all right, and it's similar to what happened at Hurricane Katrina. And I work with those lawyers, and I think this is a health crisis that's being ignored. And I know they want to get on, but I just want to say one thing, that when we transfer this property over, or they want to transfer, it's illegal not to have a true assessment. So we're hearing from whistleblowers that are coming to me that they don't want to hear, people who work for NYCHA, that the records of where the soil was at recent other places have been deep six. So it's not only not doing the records, the records that they have to show that what's bad is being disappeared. To me, if, I think I didn't even have to go to law school to know that's illegal and insulting to everybody here. So I think the main thing is, is I agree with our council president here, um, is that it's the people that are in charge at NYCHA that have shown total malfeasance and we are in Flint, they're just not testing, it's, you can't do an excuse that you couldn't get to it, that it's basically a criminal charge. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. We got, we got two more speakers I'm going to be wrapping it up. Criminal is the absolute correct word, right? I believe, personally, that our residents have been put in this state of emergency on purpose. The last time we did a rally here at City Hall, our mayor did a counter protest at the exact same time to push this public housing blueprint. We want to talk about the legality. The New York City Housing Authority has been sued. There is a lawsuit, there is a consent decree that is active now. And how much, how much of that consent decree has been fulfilled thus far? So rather than addressing what's needed, the Housing Authority is trying to scapegoat and go into a whole nother program that will not will, that will make the consent decree irrelevant. Right. Two more expert residents, and then we are going to wrap up. But I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out, for staying in this call, and regardless of how many times they tried to silence us, we lift our voices. Yes. 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 So from Coney Island. I'm going to bring one of our field residents up. Yes. 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 Hello, everyone. My name is Ann Valdez. I'm a third generation in Gravesend Houses in Coney Island, which is the first development built in Coney Island. Now, let me tell you something. We're talking about trust and PAC and all these, all these other programs, which are really nonsense, okay? It's just a ploy. A ploy, I tell you to take away our homes and our freedoms, all right? We are not gonna sit here and exacerbate the homeless population just because this entity wants us to believe they're looking out for us. They didn't look out for us 20 years ago. Why would they look out for us now? All right, I come from a community that is one of the superstars Sandy communities. Here we are, 10 years later, and they still haven't completed it. I have a development, two developments in Coney Island for sure. One has not had gas for over a year. Do you know what it costs and how it feels to not be able to feed yourself and your family? Yes. That ain't right. But they don't care. It had to take the residents, the resident leader, and my wonderful assemblywoman, Dr. Matilde Frontes, to bring notice to this and to bring lawyers in so that these people have a leg to stand on. Yet, you will hear from said resident engagement that the PAC, well, not the PAC, that the trust is a good program and we should all stand behind it. If you couldn't trust NYCHA then, why would you trust them now? Okay, now. Okay, they don't care about us. 
As I said, I am a third generation. My family moved in in 1954. That was a time when you lived in public housing and you felt like a human being. Yes. Now, all you feel is like the dirt under their shoes. We need to have, even NYCHA needs to be run by people of New York. Not of somewhere yes. else. Yes. 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 All right. And these programs may have worked or may not have worked in other states, no, they but they work. damn sure are not going to work here. We are the largest city with the proudest people, and we're not going to have it. That's right. So I'm here to fight, whether it be today, tomorrow, or for the next ten years. But I'm not letting it happen. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yes. Right. 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 One last speaker before we wrap it up. Yeah. Two, two more speakers. I'm gonna ask both of y'all to keep it because we gotta get up in there in that hearing where we're gonna be on the record to testify. Um, so I'm gonna skip my part and I'm just gonna bring up our next dynamic speaker, one who has been in this fight for as long as I have been in this fight, Mr. Russell Taylor. Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Russell Taylor. I'm a NYCHA resident. I moved in NYCHA in 1972. Right now, I'm an elected official as county committee in the Democratic Party. That's right. And the 69th Assembly District. And I'm not gonna let this go down without a fight. True, I believe true, that true. the RAD and the PAC are bad programs that end Section 9 public housing. And we should not let this legislation of the trust in our public housing. So I want to say shortly that this is social engineering and capital racism. They are not giving us the power to do resident management cooperation. Like they said earlier, they did not speak about it, but we know about it. The 964 legislation that we have in public housing is our Bible. So we got to use this legislation in order to fight back against what NYCHA is proposing. And I'm going to testify a little bit later, but thank you very much. And let's just keep fighting in a concerted way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love all of our powers, but the Lower East Side knows how to rap. I'm proud to be a Lower East Sider and someone who has mentored me from my beginning days as a community organizer on the Lower East Side, Ms. Mildred Martinez.
because de Blasio was running for, me, for president. What does it tell you? They did a backdoor deal with Campos Plaza because it's prime real estate. I put in, in the ID, the, in the Inspector General's office for an investigation because they sold out Campos Plaza for their own political game on the backside of the low-income families. <laughs> and I, they're trying to do it again in Campos Plaza too. I requested an investigation on it because now they want $145 $145,000 per apartment to renovate Campos Plaza that is not dilapidated. The rep was supposed to start all the way in the Bronx where the buildings were dilapidated. Why are they coming to prime real estate? That's a disrespect to us. That is not fair. The mayor should be charged. They should start investigating him. How did he run for mayor, brother, for president, when he wasn't born with a silver, a silver spoon? Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I requested it, um, um, freedom of in information. I requested a document on, on 205. Do you know that they said that he have no information on them? How could they not have any information? Yes, sir. But I can go on and on. I would like the city of New York to be investigated. Right. Because they're using New York City mm -hmm. Housing Authority like their, their, their debit yeah. card. Yeah. Right. That's their Credit debit card. card. Debit whatever card. they want. And what we should start doing is holding our elected officials accountable for what they're not doing to protect us. That's right. Because we're electing right. them into office. That's right. Let's start rocking behind. New York City Housing Authority has more than 600,000 residents. And the population, the homeless population, has to be over 200,000. And they're sugarcoating it. But we have to start demanding for the real numbers. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. I, am so, I, have, I haven't invested interest in my, my development because this is not a country house. This is our home. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And we have to get all these elected officials on, on, on blast and let them know that we mean business. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. This is not the end of the conversation. We wanted to make sure that you understood the truth, that you heard from the residents before we go into that hearing and hear the rhetoric that will come out of the New York City Housing Authority's mouth. We are here today and we are gonna continue the conversation with every single testimony, resident testimony that goes up today that emphasizes the need for resident input, for resident decision making. The worst thing that could ever happen to the Housing Authority, to HUD, and to the elected officials who voted for the Public Housing Preservation Trust is to have an educated resident speak up about the truth. We are proud to stand as their enemy, as the educated resident who knows what's going on. We will not allow the Housing Authority to determine who will represent us on the city on, on the citywide council of presidents. Right. We will not allow our developments to go mm -hmm. into rad and pack right. without resident decision making. Okay, no. We will not allow ten percent of residents to decide if one hundred percent of residents are gonna be enrolled into the public housing preservation trust. Yes. And we are pushing, we are demanding that residents have an opportunity to form a resident management corporation. Yes. Because as Aisa Torres said, when residents are in charge, public housing works. Public housing needs to be expanded. We have a homelessness crisis going on in New York City. And the solution to that crisis is more housing. 
more housing, not less. So let's go in there and let's educate these elected officials and let's make sure that our city council hears from us and not the rhetoric of the New York City Housing Authority. Thank you very much. Woo!